It is a truism that revolutions are terrible things. They're bloody, sordid affairs, led by utopian dogmatists and mobs of zealots. And inevitably, they lead to corruption, oppression, and macabre perversions of truth. And this is because the very essence of revolution is an anti-empirical one, an anti-reality. Revolutionaries assume that history doesn't matter, and that one can wake up one day and simply sweep away what was, without any repercussions or blowback, whilst ushering in a new world out of nothing. But this is a fantasy, and it is a fantasy that is instinctively obvious to those parts of the world descended from Anglo-Saxonism. And this is because of a shared inheritance derived from the original Anglo-Saxons that placed value in participatory politics and justice, and thus tied both to the real world of real people. And through the centuries, this evolved into inductive common law, where real cases are used to create a transcendent, empirical legal equality. This set, and it sets, the Anglo-Saxon world as distinct, at least in part, from the European, or as it used to be called, the Roman world, in which Roman law that was deductive, abstract, and top-down, was and is the norm, and the law is whatever the current rulers say it is. Indeed, this total conflict between the UK's constitutional system and that of the EU really is at the heart of Brexit. But there is a visceral and inherent conundrum in the Anglo-Saxon world, because it has produced two great revolutions, both of which were, in their conclusion, hugely successful. So how can this be? England was always a peculiar country. Its political system remained intact after contact with Christianity. Certainly, Roman ideas bureaucratized the Anglo-Saxon political system, but the values stayed remarkably native, and the result of this was that throughout the centuries and even millennia that would follow, the political process of England was one of constantly harking back and reasserting participatory politics and national life. In practice, this meant that, unlike in Europe, revolutions were not the order of the day. The average Englishman wanted to join the establishment, not bring it down. Part of the reason for this was this kind of national memory of original values, however romanticised. But the other, as just alluded to, was that England was, from its inception, one of, if not the earliest, nation-state in Europe. And thus, as a nation, it was illogical to want to tear the society down, since it was what everybody lived in. Instead, the goal was to make the nation-state truly live up to its name, a state of and for the nation, the people. This made England totally different from Europe. In Europe, feudalism was the norm. There was no nation-state concept. You were a subject of your local baron or earl, who in turn paid often flippant homage to a king, a head earl. France, in the medieval period, was no more a country than a collection of corporations, where each baron was a self-contained corporation, or with a titular head known as the king. Likewise, for the Holy Roman Empire, it was an empire, a collection of people put together purely in a bureaucratic system. Therefore, in Europe, the order of the day was simply tyranny, rule or be ruled. And so it made sense to be revolutionary, because there was nothing about the old system that was worth keeping. You wanted to destroy it, to destroy the old establishment, because you wanted to be the new lord with your ideas. So this is the first point then, that revolutions are not culturally natural to the Anglo-Saxon peoples, and in a manner similar to Plato's philosopher King, who was reluctant to rule, so too those Anglo-Saxons reluctant to engage in revolution are less likely to be enamoured by the revolutionary zeal. But this then leads us to a second uncomfortable reality. Why then were the English the first to overthrow their monarch in an ostensibly revolutionary way? The reason lay in a semantic argument. Because although the English Revolution is nominally called as such, the English Civil War was really a fight between Renaissance parliamentarians and a revolutionary slash reactionary absolute monarchy. Revolutionary because it was alien to Englishness, and reactionary because it sought to ape the worst excesses of previous kings. The so-called English Revolution existed within its own time, with its own values and new ideas, and certainly, like all groups, the parliamentarians were thinking of themselves and their own power. but. They did so in the context that it was the English, the Anglo-Saxon way, that a monarch should not be absolute and that politics must be participatory. And they ostentatiously hearkened back to this idea, no matter how romanticised it may have been. Can a renaissance be considered a revolution? 
The idea is absurd. A renaissance is, in fact, a word for the natural and likely best evolution of any stable, successful society. It is the refinding, the retesting, the re-evaluating, and crucially, the conjoining of tried and tested values with a new time and new circumstances. As a side note, you can see why the left is so vehemently against what it calls cultural appropriation, because cultural appropriation is what a renaissance is. The renaissance of Europe was a continental act of cultural appropriation, of bringing ancient Greek ideas into the late medieval and Christian world. People that believe in renaissance do not believe in revolution, and vice versa, because a renaissance presupposes the value of real history, and revolutionaries do not. And also do note that reactionaryism is simply the other extreme of revolutionaryism. It is a desire to pretend that the present hasn't happened, just as revolutionaries pretend that the past hasn't happened. A better candidate for full-on revolution in England occurred about a century prior to the English Civil War, when Henry VIII broke with Rome. England itself, as a nation-state, was technically a Catholic one from its inception, even if the Anglo-Saxons originally were not. But even then, the word revolution has its limits. Henry VIII's arguments were in fact explicitly based upon research that said that England had always been a unique self-governing nation, i.e. a renaissance. Furthermore, Henry essentially replaced the Pope in England, and the Protestant Reformation itself, merely a backdrop to Henry's aims, was one giant act of renaissance, at least in theory. Its supporters claimed that they were refinding the original ideas of Christianity. Of course, the English Revolution did not solve England's problems overnight. Parliament, as happened exactly in late 2019 with the prorogation debacle, tried to make itself eternal with a fixed-term Parliament Act, and as such Oliver Cromwell ended up closing it using the army and presiding over a dictatorial republic for a decade, incidentally accepting all of the hallmarks of kingship, even if he refused the name. England thus came quite close to its own Caesar moment. But the process, in retrospect, was a national moment of pause, of reflection, of the gravity of what had happened. And it led not to a brand new system, but the re-establishment of the constitutional monarchy, and parliament, and participatory politics. They even invited the dead king's son to retake his father's throne. In other words, the civil war was not fought to change the system, but to change the king. And the long-term results of the so-called English Revolution were such a success that its constitutional settlement is the one that the United Kingdom uses right up until this day, and it is only the ongoing repercussions of the two world wars, the subsequent takeover of the establishment by left liberals, and the breakdown shown by Brexit that suggests that this constitution may be due a renewal. But what then of the American colonies revolution, that is much more convincingly a revolution, and occurred as it did at that critical moment of history, where France ushered in a new era for continental Europe. After all, the American colonists did overthrow for good a king and a monarchical system, and they did create a system for a burgeoning new state, all in the context of the highly revolutionary Enlightenment era. Well, somewhat. What is a president if not an elected monarch? Certainly, the President of the United States has far more power than the United Kingdom's monarch. The American system is not quite as different to the British one as many may think. One of the ways that you can tell that the American revolutionaries weren't as revolutionary as you may think is that they actually achieved the aims that they set out to accomplish. Let's be clear, for revolutionaries, this is truly impressive to the extent that it makes you realize that the American colonists were far too grounded in reality and empiricism to be actual revolutionaries. But did the French Revolution usher in the Enlightenment utopia it promised? Did the Soviet Revolution in Russia usher in the Communist utopia? Did the Nazis' Revolution usher in a thousand-year Reich? True revolutionaries can be spotted by their total abject failure. And the Seattle Autonomous Zone was, though funny in isolation, also a grimly vivid look at what a genuine revolution in America would look like. Now, the truth is that the Founding Fathers were Renaissance figures, just as in England. They had a clear notion that English, Anglo-Saxon ideals were being trodden on by the King of Britain, and that they needed to be re-established, summed up elegantly in that one phrase, no taxation without representation. 
They even won the war in the good old English tradition of allying with the French against the king. And as such, the US's constitution is in fact a very light editing of the English constitution of the day. The founding fathers simply highlighted most explicitly those parts that were considered anti-tyranny, such as the right to bear arms, and they added the Enlightenment era vocabulary of their day, such as all men are created equal. And for those that doubt that the founding fathers were Renaissance men more than they were revolutionaries, you can go to the American National Archives building, where you shall find, right there, next to the Constitution, next to the Bill of Rights, next to the Declaration of Independence, a little document called Magna Carta. This was an explicit Renaissance. Again, mixed with the contemporary ideas of its day, but with a very solid eye on history. Now, the American story does differ at this point from the English and British one, because America, being born in the Enlightenment, decided not to continue with the English unwritten constitutional system. Instead, it became a written constitutional system. And this becomes problematic for us again, because this means that it was not an Anglo-Saxon state as such, but a Platonic state, a Roman state with universalist ideas. But no values are eternal. In fact, they are entirely contemporary. And sometimes this Platonic mentality does show in the way that the Constitution is treated with religious reverence. But the reason why the American Revolution did not turn out like its sister revolution in France, and why America became such a successful country and empire, was that the French Platonic state also enshrined Platonic values, making it an abstract, utopian, revolutionary state. Whilst the Americans embodied English values and words enshrining Anglo-Saxonism, that is, empirical, Renaissance values, into their constitution. And so, in a paradox, the USA created a universalist state imbued with explicitly contemporaneous values, or to put it another way, a Roman state that had all the hallmarks of the English state. And there is something that is wonderfully human about this paradox. It is certainly much better than a claim of certainty and purity which is what the French Revolution had. And in fact, the creation of America as it was, was really the inevitable result of having a renaissance of English values set at the height of the Enlightenment. And it may be that being part of the New World may have encouraged the Founding Fathers to believe that they could shed the baggage of the Old World, but they never pretended that the Old World did not exist or was not important. In fact, it is arguable that the USA's governmental system is less a system of government and more a system of anti-tyranny. Each separation of power can effectively roadblock another, such as the result of a renaissance that occurs in the context of overturning a tyrant and settling a country where government was supposed to be limited, and that any roadblocks in it were thus hopefully not actually to be that detrimental to a free market society, so to speak. And so this is why the Anglo-Saxon revolutions appear so uniquely successful, because they weren't really revolutions, certainly not in the same way that most of Europe has had them. They were specific to Anglo-Saxonism and the Anglo-Saxon world, distinct from European or Romanism. They sought to rekindle the values that had made them so successful and gave longevity in the first place, and to adapt the lessons of the past to the present situation.